Welcome to lecture eight of section two. And this one we're going to talk about hormones. We're going to talk about specific ones. We're going to talk about the stress hormones and the responses of stress. This is my favorite lecture of the course, and hopefully you'll hear it in my voice. Enjoy the excitement. Watch this video if you haven't already. It's a great summary of, you know, giving the big picture of everything we're going to talk about. So go watch it if you haven't. If you have, we're going to move right into the lecture. The stressors are things or challenges, events, uh, could be internal, could be external, things that challenge our body's homeostasis and triggers arousal. So the stress response is actually that physiological and behavioral res response by our body to go back to homeostasis and reduce the stress that we're feeling. The stress response is actually an adaptive, uh, well-orchestrated response by our body. There are two major systems that support the stress arousal response. One's the autonomic response, so the autonomic nervous system, and the other is the HPA axis or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And that tells you exactly the different areas that are involved in these, these responses. The autonomic nervous system is, as it sounds, nervous system related, directly innervated, where nerves leave the brain, go down the brain stem, and intersect with the adrenal medulla. The HPA axis it goes from the hypothalamus here to the pituitary and then to the adrenal cortex. So those are the two axes. So we're going to talk about those in depth as we move through this lecture. One of the things that's important to understand is that these two systems work in concert. The autonomic nervous system, given that it is the nervous system and it works on action potentials, is very quick. It is one to two minutes, you can see the response in the blood. The HPA axis, however, uses the bloodstream because it's a neuroendocrine or an endocrine process. And the endocrine system we know uses what? To get information around. It uses the circulatory system, so it's slower. So it's gonna take time for you to see the rise in the HPA response. And the last hormone is what we're talking about, which is cortisol. So a quick review of the autonomic nervous system. There are two divisions of it. There's the sympathetic nervous system, which is represented over here, and there's the parasympathetic nervous system. Well, arousal is the activation or the sympathetic nervous system being activated, and it innervates and changes the functionality of all these different organs that it touches, that it intervenes, interacts with. For the sympathetic to become more activated, this, the parasympathetic actually withdraws and it stops dousing these organs and body sites with acetylcholine and allows the norepinephrine from the sympathetic nervous system to flood. So sympathetic activates, parasympathetic inhibits, and then norepinephrine is used by the sympathetic nervous system to tell the muscles uh, to behave in a certain way or tells the stomach to stop digesting, increases the lung capacity, but also the lung breath rate increases the heart rate. That's what norepinephrine does when it's being released on these organs. The acetylcholine, when you're in a state of rest, parasympathetic is highly active and it inhibits these systems. So it, it inhibits the arousal response. So it slows the heart down. It slows the breathing rate down. It allows the digestive tract to function well. So the SAM axis is a, is the endocrine axis that we talk about when we're discussing the autonomic nervous system, because it is the sympathetic, meaning the sympathetic nervous system, and it innervates or connects to the adrenal medulla or SAM axis. So the spinal cord, via the spinal cord and the sympathetic nerve, we end up having the sympathetic nerves activate the adrenal medulla by releasing norepinephrine in here, and that then produces mass amounts of epinephrine and some more uh, norepinephrine. When this happens, as I mentioned before, the parasympathetic system withdraws. It's just a natural balance. Typically, it's a natural balance the body goes through. So what's supported by the autonomic response? This is that fight or flight you've probably heard about in other classes, or you may have felt in your own life. Increased heart rate, you can read all these symptoms, but basically it's allowing your body to have increased energy and alertness, and it slows digestion and it takes away energy from places that we don't need energy going. Because if you're in a life or death situation, you don't care if you're breaking the food down in your stomach because uh, you may never need it, right? So you need to be able to, it's self-preservation. 
You're either fighting to win or you're running away as fast as you can. So that's the first response. It's quick, it's fast, and it happens very quickly and it shuts off very quickly because it's based on action potentials. As soon as the stressor is not detected anymore, the action potentials will stop. The hypothalamus will stop sending the message via the sympathetic nervous system saying to have the, the SAM access response. If the stressor is potent enough and long enough where the sympathetic's been activated, but you need to sustain the activation, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or HP axis comes on board. This is going to start using that hierarchy with regards to the, the endocrine and neuroendocrine system that we talked about last lecture, where the hypothalamus is the king, right? It's the top one. It produces a releasing hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone, and that floods the anterior pituitary with adrenocorticotropin hormone, which then gets released into the bloodstream from the, from the anterior pituitary and goes to everywhere in the body, right? Because it's the cardiovascular system. You don't have control but its main targeted organ is the adrenal cortex, which then produces cortisol. So one way to remember this is that each system is targeting a different part or of the adrenal. The HPA axis, the end product is cortisol, and cortisol comes from the cortex. So C and C go together. Hopefully that'll help you piece together or remember. So let's look at this as an, er a neur as an endocrine pathway. So you have the hypothalamus, you have a solid line, meaning positive, increase activation of the anterior pituitary by CRH. Then you have another plus or positive for CTH where it goes to the adrenal cortex and binds and produces cortisol. Cortisol is that end hormone. So this is where we talked about the necessary the need for endocrine systems to have negative feedback. So that's why this line is dashed. So as cortisol levels rise in the body and the hormones, what happens is the hormone starts being used by the muscles and by the organs and everything that's around so that it's being used and it's being pulled out of the bloodstream. But when you get past the stressor, that those cortisol hormone levels are gonna to start to rise because the cells aren't taking it in because it doesn't need it anymore. And once the cortisol levels get high enough that they are detected by the brain at the hippocampus and other areas, it shuts off the hypothalamus saying, hey, stop the CRH. And it also stop, It also goes to the anterior pituitary and says, stop, we don't need any more ACTH. So you get a double negative. Uh, and then that stops and shuts down the system. So there's a negative effect there. But cortisol also goes off and has major effects on the body. So here's a quick picture because I love pictures. Um, you've got your hypothalamus, CRH is positive impact on ACTH, or excuse me, on the anterior pituitary to produce ACTH, which goes off and has a positive effect on the adrenal cortex, which pumps out cortisol. And as cortisol levels start to rise, it has a negative impact on both the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. So what are the effects of the HP access? Cortisol is a catabolic hormone, which means that it causes breakdown for energy purposes. So proteins get converted to glucose. It um, stops it or decreases or inhibits the, the secretion of insulin. Therefore, your cells are allowing glucose into the bloodstream, which our muscles need if we're in a state of fighting or fleeing. Blood flow increases, changes immune cells, get them, gets those from ready and having ready to be responsive. The other thing that's interesting about the HP axis, and this is kind of where we start to segue into some of the ideas for section three, uh, and showing you that there's a link between the physiology and the emotional pieces, the, the real cognitive piece, is that CRH, so the corticotropin releasing hormone produced by the hypothalamus, there are receptors for that hormone in the hippocampus and the cingulate gyrus and the amygdala. Now those areas, I don't know if you recall, or we, we, from the first section, we talked about what the hippocampus does and we definitely talked about what the amygdala, we may not have covered the cingulate gyrus. So what is the hippocampus connected to? What about the amygdala? Think about that. And why are those areas connected to emotion? Well, emotions, especially negative emotions, which is usually what's associated with stress, we typically wanna remember those so that we avoid the stressor in the future. So the amygdala, is fear, negative emotion, it gets activated. Hippocampus is responsible for memory, which helps us remember the situation we were in right before, during, and after, so that we may avoid it in the future. And the cingulate gyrus is an area that's 
related to pain. We didn't get into a ton of that when we talked about somatosensory and touch and, and when pain happens. But if it's a negative emotional state or a negative stressful response, there's going to probably be some type of pain, whether it's physical or emotional. So CRH is priming all these areas to be active and ready to receive information or that the information they're receiving is important to remember. So here are uh, the two systems together. It is a coordinated response. As I mentioned, the SAM axis happens first because it's innervated. It is using the nervous system. It is the hypothalamus telling the brainstem and spinal cord to send a message to the adrenal medulla, pump out epinephrine and norepinephrine, support the fight or flight response. And then the HPA axis is stimulated, same time. It just shows up later because it uses this cardiovascular system. So the hypothalamus secretes CRH, which affects the anterior pituitary, produce ACTH, which then goes to the adrenal cortex to produce cortisol. So which one's which? I'm going to break them down. We're going to review different qualities, and you're going to need to be able to identify which side is HPA and which side is SAM. So it's an immediate response versus it appears to be delayed. Direct innervation. It uses the circulatory system. Release of epinephrine, norepinephrine. Release of a series of hormones. Short term. Seconds to minutes, we'll see the outcome. Long term, minutes to hours. Shuts off when the brain no longer detects a stressor. Relies on negative feedback to shut off. So which side's which? Which one's the HPA? Which one's the SAM? Hopefully you said that the one on the left are all characteristics that are connected to the SAM axis, while all the things, all the descriptors on the right are connected to things with the HPA axis or the endocrine response. The good thing that you use these two systems to compare and contrast your understanding of the stress response. Now I want to do kind of a step beyond of just the stress system and talk about things that influence the stress response. We do know that men, males, have a greater cortisol response to acute stressors than females. This has been replicated over and over again since the late 1990s. Um, but here you have the stress response. The, uh, we bring our individuals in, you get some baseline measures, you put them through a psychosocial stressor, and then you watch their cortisol response. So that's what these are right here. This is their cortisol and their saliva. The closed symbols are females and the open circles are men. You can see that men have the greatest response. But you also see that women in the luteal phase has just as robust of a response, very close. I don't, these are not statistically different. See, they overlap up here. However, women in the follicular or women who are using oral contraceptives, they have a lower, what appears to be a lower endocrine response. What are, the, what are some of the underlying differences for why men, men have a greater cortisol response than females? Well, it turns out that testosterone, which elevates in preparation for physical stress and competition, which is a time when your HPX is getting activated, also potentiates the HPX. So men just naturally have higher testosterone in their bodies. It's one of those sexually dimorphic hormones. And they it will help support, it just has a stronger uh, background in which the cortisol can be produced. Vasopressin is similar. Men have more higher levels of vasopressin than females do. Therefore, the increases, the, the support of vasopressin increasing CRH and ACTH then increases the end outcome, which is cortisol. The other piece that's interesting is that estradiol, which is the primary female hormone that is actually elevated in oral contraceptives, as well as in naturally in women during the follicular phase, is that it actually interferes with the bioavailability of cortisol. And I'm getting a little technical on you, but I want to help explain what bioavailable means because we've already talked about it, but we just didn't use that terminology. In your body, Hormones float around while they're free floating, or they might travel around while they're connected to proteins. Do you remember the time we talked about this before? When was a time where hormones bound to proteins and then couldn't get across the brain? If you're thinking about estradiol binding to fetal protein, alpha fetal protein during in utero development, and that's why it does not cross into the blood brain, cross over the blood brain barrier and cause the brain to change in females. You're right. It's the same kind of concept here. Well, cortisol floats around 
free, but it also floats around bound by estradiol or with estradiol, it makes it complex. When it creates a complex like that, it removes the bioavailability of both the cortisol and the estradiol to function. They, can no, they cannot bind. So these are two hormones that are steroid hormones. So they should easily be able to get across cell membranes. But when they're bound together, they're too big. So in that complex, they're reducing their bioavailability and the cortisol cannot get across the cell membrane or across any membranes in the body, whether it's the blood brain barrier or whether it's your salivary gland. So we can use saliva to measure cortisol, but the only cortisol that shows up in saliva is the free cortisol, is the cortisol that's not bound to other proteins or bound estradiol. This may be one of the reasons why females down here have a, are having a lower, what appears to be a lower endocrine response. Their free cortisol is lower, which is important because if it can't get across into the saliva, it's not getting across into cells either. Some of you may have heard of the tend and befriend theory. I like to touch on it here because I think it's important as we are a class devoted to understanding brain and behavior. Tend and befriend theory came out as a complementary or a way to consider a shift in the fight or flight response, stress response. And it stems because female, what happened was the fight or flight response is based on research done primarily in men and primarily actually in male rodents. So male rodents, when they're freaked out and stressed, they freeze. Why is that adaptive? If you weren't aware, rodents primary predators are owls and birds, things that identify their prey by movement. So being able to freeze means that the prey, excuse me, that the predator won't be able to see them and therefore they'll survive and they'll breed more and have more babies. Uh, so this became a survival trait, this freezing ability. Well, female rodents don't do that. How odd, huh? So what happened was researchers back in the you know, 40s and 50s when they were doing this work just assumed that the female rodents weren't having a stress response. They weren't looking inside. They weren't looking to look at serum levels to see what was actually happening. Well, it turns out in the 1990s, um, a group, and this included my grad graduate advisor, Laura Klein, who did a lot of animal work and was really interested in sex differences. She went and studied and did her postdoc with a social psychologist who worked primarily with humans. And they started talking about this phenomenon that female rodents don't have the behavior of freezing, but their endocrine response, their corticosterone, their cortisol response was actually higher than the male rodents. And they started thinking about that. Well, evolutionarily, freezing was good for males. It did allow them to survive because they weren't the caretakers for their young. And that role does primarily fall, especially in, in the wild animal kingdom, on the female. So for females, it was actually better to be able to tend to your young to keep them quiet to keep them safe from their surrounding predators. And that was the skill that was actually, uh, was actually groomed by evolution and natural selection, is that you were good at keeping the next generation quiet so that they survived. So basically that there's, in our society even still to this day, supports that, that females are expected to be more invested in their offspring especially early on in care. And then blending in with your environment, so that's blending, and then creating and maintaining social networks or befriending. So they call it tend and befriend. And we see this in society. We see that females often go to their friends during times of stress. And it's really important for women to have, you know, not all women, but many women, I'm talking stereotypically and I know that, um, that they, you know, seek to have large social networks and they can utilize whichever part of it they need to at whatever time they need to. So it's an interesting concept and this really stemmed out of looking at rodent work because it turned out what the female rats were doing 
is instead of freezing, they were actually going to each other and grooming each other, helping clean each other. So again, you're tending to other people, you're building your network, and um, you are, and it's interesting, right? So anyway, so that's the theory of tender befriend and how it developed. The underlying hormone that they thought was supporting this was that oxytocin was actually changing the way the HPA axis responded. Um, theoretically speaking, that's a, a possibility, but it turns out that um, the research to this today to date has not actually shown that. Uh, there is some data that has shown that people, men and women, who have higher levels of oxytocin compared to those who have lower levels of oxytocin, that they actually um, have a better stress response. They have a rise and then they have a recovery. So it's a healthy, normal, adapted, acute stress response. Individuals with low oxytocin have that rise, but then they don't reduce or recover as quickly. So their cortisol stays elevated longer, which would be maladaptive because we don't need cortisol present if we're not using it. So does this make you feel stressed? That's my license plate. Yes, I do. I think it's funny. It's my PSA announcement, or I'm asking people to, to decide whether I'm stressed based on my driving. I'm not sure. One of the things I want you to know is that stress is a normal part of life. Having an acute stress response is adaptive and beneficial. And we know that stress isn't always bad. There's this beautiful inverted U where if you maintain your stress level in this medium or level, whichever that is, and there are individual differences for people, that your performance is actually better when stress is low or when stress is too high is where performance suffers. So being stressed at that optimal level for yourself is actually a good thing because it keeps you on your toes, it keeps you thinking. Um, I mean, we know that epinephrine and norepinephrine keep the brain awake and activate it, and keep arousal and keep focus. All good things when you're trying to perform. What happens is that stress in today's society often gets closer to this high end where then your performance starts to suffer and the body starts to wear out. And that's where it becomes bad is when it becomes a chronic a severe chronic stressor. So how do we manage stress? And I like to end on this because I think it's important for you all to recognize that you need to be aware that stress is present. Uh, our culture uh, thrives on it and it's not healthy. But we have really strong ways, really known, well-validated ways to manage stress. We just don't implement the practices. So there are healthy skills and there are less healthy skills. Healthy skills include things like exercise and yoga and being with friends and having a good support network, as well as things like meditation, mindfulness, and disconnecting from technology, using positive reappraisal and strengthening our spiritual selves are all ways in which we can manage stressful life. One of the easiest things we can do is change our breathing pattern. So do a little a trick with me. I want you to find your pulse in your neck. And I want you just to feel the rhythm that you've got going on there. And then I'm going to ask you to breathe in and breathe out at the pace I'm going to direct you to. And I want you to see if you can notice any changes in your heart rate, all right? So breathe in and out. And in and out. What did you notice? If you didn't notice it, do it again. In and out. When you breathe in, your heart rate speeds up. And when you breathe out, your heart rate slows down. So the exhale should be longer. If you're going to do stress management techniques, your exhale should always be a longer amount of time than your inhale. 
And what that's doing is it's stimulating your parasympathetic nervous system. And it is having that be more active and forcing it to be more aroused and therefore causing the sympathetic to calm down. Anytime you're in an immediately stressful situation, if you focus on your breathing and you change it to breathing in and breathing out, you breathe in for three counts, breathe out for five or seven if you can, and you will immediately feel calmer. Trust me, next time, try it. There are also less healthy to unhealthy methods. And these are things that most of us probably do because society reinforces it. Being a slave to time, thinking that the more work you put in, the further along you're gonna get, which in reality what's gonna happen is you're just gonna get more work. Um, we sleep less, we think we can spend more time working and sleeping less, we'll get things done, but we actually lose our efficiency when we sleep less. Eating comfort foods. These comfort foods are not apples or bananas or a glass of milk. It's like um, pecan pie or uh, ice cream with chocolate and caramel, um, or it's a you know fried French fries and a burger. So these are high calorie, high density foods. Again, you're probably not exercising and you don't need that food, but it makes you feel good. We also can do things um, by using drugs or whether they're prescription or over the counter or if they're illicit or illicit. We, we escape. Stress is, can be overwhelming at times and we often try to escape from it and drugs give us that relief. Um, it's a very real, very quick response, makes you feel better um, and lots of people do it. Just because lots of people do it doesn't mean it's good for you. Figuring out how to naturally manipulate your biology without adding in drugs to either calm it down like alcohol or benzodiazepine or anything like that, um, or keeping yourself stimulated to keep yourself awake so you can do more work with like caffeine or stimulants like Adderall or other types of things like that. Those are ways to override your biology to try to get more work done. And it's not gonna, in the long run, it's not gonna help you out. And it's actually gonna make things worse because you're probably gonna end up getting sick. So try to figure out what are those healthy skills you can develop. And if you have unhealthy ones, start by trying to reduce how much you use them. Sometimes it's hard to go cold turkey on any one of those things. Um, Trust me, it's hard to get to sleep when your mind's racing, right? Um, or it's hard to not eat that ice cream when you're stressed out. But try to figure out how you can, at little steps, make a way towards not using unhealthy behaviors. All right, that is it for my stress management. Trust me, everybody feels it. And the best, the most successful people are the people who figure out how to manage it and keep themselves in that uh, inverted you up at that tippy top. These are where your most successful people live is in that level of stress for themselves. And that varies from person to person. My threshold, my ability to succeed is higher on the stress level than most people's. I need pressure. I need deadlines to perform. And I know that about myself. So I keep myself busy. Anyways, hope that's been helpful. And that's the end of the material for exam two. Thanks.